This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero safely on your iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source and you always control your own keys and seed. And by XMR.to. Anonymously exchange your Monero into Bitcoin and seamlessly send Monero to any Bitcoin address. Go to XMR.to or use it right in your Cake Wallet. Cake Wallet and XMR.to are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman continues his conversation with Lee Claggett about the network attacks against Monero. In part two, Lee goes into detail about the second attack, potential reasons behind doing such a thing, how many actions have been taken in the course of the two attacks, and the effects on the network. They also discuss if the attacks are still happening, what issues and concerns came about while actively working on the attack, and if there is a fear that hastily patching could lead to accidentally adding a bug. Monero Talk starts now. So let's go back to the attacks. We talked about the first. What is the second? I guess is the first attack is still, is still ha- it's not, we haven't gone past it. It's still. Correct. Because fought. that battle's still being fought. And now there's a new front, the second <laughs> attack. Right? Correct. Because one, one of the issues is that um, this, a lot of this stuff started after the, the hard fork. And since we're not hard forking, um, it's just too problematic to hard fork that quickly. Users are not forced to upgrade. So the attacker can still go to older nodes. It can still look at the software changes we've made and maybe tweak it for some of the newer connections. They have multiple, because again, they can see, the other advantage is they can see our code being pub- published publicly. And then a couple of the developers review it. So while it takes like one or two days for us to review it before we distribute it, they then had one or two days to then possibly counteract to that. So that's sort of why it's sort of ongoing. Um, they may be able to react again to what we've done. Not clear at this point, but on top of it, um, there's nodes that haven't upgraded. And so they can still sort of mess with those nodes. So that's primarily what we're seeing. The second attack, I think it started on Christmas Eve. I'm not exactly sure. I didn't, I wasn't at physically at my computer when this went down. So the second ta- attack was a memory exhaustion attack where um, they use a technique to use a significant amount of memory on on the node and what would happen is it the typically the operating system would kill the process for taking up too much memory so the first question is well why would someone do this (laughs) one of the things that seemed to happen was that they were using tor exit nodes to do this attack so the result was whoever did this many people in the Monero community as a quick workaround began banning Tor exit nodes from connecting to them. So to clarify why this is kind of interesting, Monero supports transactions relayed over Tor. Currently does not support synchronizing over Tor directly. And this is for denial of service purposes. We've decided at least for the time being, I mean, we're still dealing with denial of service stuff right now. So for the time being, we have not allowed syn- synchronizing with the network over Tor. However, for some people, um, they've decided that they want to hide from their local ISP or authority or whatever it is. I don't really know that they're going to run everything over Tor. Unfortunately, this means they have to use Tor exit nodes, meaning they have to route to the Tor network and then it has to leave the Tor network and jump back to the Monero network. So the downside is whoever was running this attack was getting most of the Monero people to block Tor exit nodes. So to clarify, anybody that was trying to aggressively hide their privacy by running Tor, by connecting through Monero solely through Tor, were probably blocked temporarily um, for a time frame. Um, And maybe still have a little trouble connecting to the network as a result. Because it depends on how many people are blocking Tor IP addresses. So again, now this one was not claimed by FireEyes. He specific, supposedly he specifically said that this was not him. Um, but again, this is an interesting privacy-related one because anybody that was really trying to 
conceal their Monero usage for whatever reason, possibly couldn't send transactions or had to accept that they're going to have to connect through normal means, you know, mm-hmm. directly over the public internet. Um, so again, I can only speculate. Who, who knows? I mean, I mean that, that that was that that was the fallout. So it's possible that that was the intended goal, or that was just an unintended consequence. I don't, or maybe they just thought it would lower the price. Who knows? I don't know. Um, but now, now are we beyond it? So have the patches been made to to thwart that? Um, mostly, it's actually somewhat tricky due to the way the protocol works. Um, because the code is reused in several places, unfortunately. So we've gotten most, we've gotten their, their basic techniques sort of made more difficult. Um, but there are some improvements that we can still do um, that we still need to work on, I think. But the, the, the trouble with this particular attack had to do with the way it was designed initially from the, from the CryptoNote developers. And to their credit, they actually designed it fairly interestingly, fairly well. Um, there's... Um, they seem to have thought about a lot of this stuff already. I mean, they probably get trash at times, but if you look at the code, parts of it are sort of squeamish the way they use templates, but on the other hand, they seem to, they seem to know a thing or two at times. So hmm. as an example, what I'm, what I'm clarifying, most people seem to think that this was related to integer compression when it wasn't. Um, and what's interesting is they have two different serialization formats. So the transactions of blocks are fairly compressed in the way they're formatted to binary, about as compressed as you can get. However, when it's sent over peer to peer, um, that compressed format is sent as a binary message in another format, which seems kind of weird at first, but what it allowed them to do was the second format does not have compressed integers and was intentionally not compressed in any way so that you're only decompressing one block or one transaction at a time to help pass. And I don't really know I'm theorizing here, but possibly to help prevent this sort of exact tech attack that occurred. Uh, the problem was that it is a form. It's a binary format, similar to message pack again, except integers are not compressed at all. Um, the difference is that objects in this format, the, when it's, when you're reading it in and it's read into an internal format so that the rest of the code can then use it, it ends up taking up more memory. So in other words, the number of mem- the amount of memory being used on the wire, so to speak, the amount of money, uh, the amount of bytes transferred over TCP um, is a bit less than the amount of memory needed to unpack it to this generic format. And it's specifically for those that are programmers, these are, it's actually the object encoding scheme that, that was the most problematic. Um, and again, this is what's interesting. The the integers were all fixed size, meaning there was no compression at all. So you couldn't run this sort of attack with with, with integers. So again, we don't know who the crypto note developers specifically who they were, or whether they intentionally did it this way. It seems, it, my guess is they probably intentionally did it this way, but there was this one oversight by a lot of people. Someone noticed it, and what it meant was when they would send a specially crafted message. Um, to unpack it, the system had to m- keep making memory requests to the point where the operating system just said, like, oh, this process is using all the system memory and just killed it. And again, it depended on if you obviously, so if you had a system, if you're one of these fancy people, like uh, we'll say Fluffy Pony with a 64 gig plus system, this sort of attack was probably not possible unless they try to do it over multiple connections simultaneously, which is a little harder to pull off. However, if you had a, if you had one of these systems, like you were discussing before, um, this guy was selling, they had about four gigs of Ram. And so the memory was, was a little bit tighter in that scenario. And so it was possible for a single connection to basically knock out the node. So this is why I say that like, it's kind of difficult to possibly eliminate things entirely. Cause there's all these weird scenarios where, well, what if the attacker is slick enough to to trigger multiple of these connections simultaneously? Um, because we the reality is that we still have to use memory to process what they're saying, what they're sending us. So it's it's kind of difficult. Um, it's also difficult to make a change while the system is running and to not because what a normal system, a centralized system would do is say, hey, everybody, like PayPal would say, hey, everybody, we're down for forty eight hours. Sorry. 
Um, we don't have that luxury. Uh, we also just can't change the protocol because we're not running because it's decentralized. So we can't just say, okay, we just changed the protocol. Everybody okay with that? Because then if all the existing systems are incompatible. Um, so we have that downside as well. We have to be at least temporarily be backwards compatible until some future release and we can drop the older stuff, right? So there's that frustration as well. It's hard to just say, okay, this thing right here is, is, is banned. Um, because until someone upgrades, they're now knocked off the network. So there's all kind of like frustrations with that where, and there's also the frustration that you can just make it not work anymore. Right. So if we're not careful, um, we just shot ourselves on the foot because some block comes in and then nobody can, can process it because we've decided we've tightened down the constraints so much that a legitimate block is in banned or from being spread. So, I mean, that, that one's probably uncommon at this point, but there's, um, what's more likely than like a, an entire network going down is that temporarily people who are trying to catch up, like for instance, they had their, they're starting their, their node for the first time or their node was down for a month. They're trying to catch up. It's possible that they're temporarily blocked offline because we constrain how much data could be sent on the network at a time. So to clarify that one of the issues that we have is people are sort of asking why these buffers are so big. And we're trying, and one of the things you had to explain is, if, if you're trying to catch up to this blockchain and if you're only sending, if you're doing a database lookup to send 500 kilobits or kilobytes, it's kind of pointless. So they typically do a lookup, fetch multiple megabytes and then send it. So there's that angle as well where, um, to be both it's hard to both be efficient and and send like and and then there's a, the angle to it we've got to like figure out how to how to make this work in the existing the existing design um is so. there how many patches have essentially oh man been been made over the course of these uh two attacks you mean the total commits or the total number of of releases we've done to the community I guess actions that have been taken were were essentially there's, changed. There's so there's been there's been at least eight. I know we're on the eight or ninth. I think we're gonna be assuming the ninth point release since the last hardware fork. Hmm. Um, so I mean that's since October, which is a very very high number. I don't think we've ever done quite this many individual by releases. I mean, uh, binary fate signs it with his GPG key, puts it up on the website, and says, "Here's a new release." Now the number of individual commits within that is even higher. I don't know. Right. It probably, but again, though, you have to remember. Sometimes these commits are like one or two line changes. Like I did one the other day that was only changing like, it changed one line and added four, like three or four others. But so technically, by concept, you know, by con, you know, if you by abstraction, it would be like fifty different changes at a time, I guess, or something like that. Like lots of little, like there was a ton of little changes. Like mm -hmm. Xiphon had a few other patches that only changed like three or four lines, but change because a lot of the things sometimes changing three or four lines in our end has a big impact on their on the, the techniques they can use for the attack so we were trying to constrain them a little bit um again this is gonna be just for the programmers one of the things we allowed for whatever reason you could send the equivalent of remember this is a binary format but the equivalent of an empty json key could be sent multiple times and so now we've changed it, for instance, that you can't have an empty key because we never used it. That was pointless. And you can't specify the multiple key multiple times in that object. And so even though this only changed a few lines, the programmer, I mean, the attacker then is now constrained on, on what they can send to do this sort of technique again. Mm -hmm. um, but again, though, we probably, I mean, we probably, it's probably, I'd, I'd say at least 50 plus, but I don't, I don't want to give people the impression that like we were, that these patches were like, were rewriting, we weren't rewriting a thousand lines of code 50 times. So it wasn't like, you know, a thousand line changes times 50. It was, it was probably more like 10, 10 lines of code times 50 or something mm -hmm. like that. And so obviously th there's, you know, people listening are concerned. Well, are, was code rushed? Is there is there a, a fear that you know uh, this could lead to uh, you know an, over, an overlooked bug or something? Yeah, um, that's I'm always mm, for what it's worth. I'm always 
the I'm probably of all the and I hope Mood doesn't mind me saying this. I'm probably one of the most cautious ones where I'm like aggressively against making changes just because I'm always like, let's not make this work. But worse. So for what it's worth, it does seem to work right now because there's one or two there's moves on like the most confident end of making changes. I'm in the least confident end, and there's one or two other people that are in the middle. So we sort of have this. Um, and actually, a shout out, I haven't mentioned his name, Celsta, another anonymous developer who's been one of the most active ones other than Moo. Um, in fact, may, apologies to Moo, may have been more active than Moo and at least um, sort of coming up with ideas. And, and Celsta has been a, a tremendous help as well. So what will happen is a lot of times we, to make sure that there's not the, to make sure that nothing really, really dumb has happened, I, I was alluding to earlier, I would make changes here locally. Um, but part of the reason for that was to make sure that I didn't break it. So sometimes I would share patches with Moo. And the reason was we didn't, I didn't want to post it publicly, be paying them primarily because who knows, like, I didn't, I didn't want an exchange or something going, oh, looks like we got a new PR or whatever, and then running it or whatever, you know, like it, we could we could do more damage than good. So we would sort of test it here locally. So we, we were actually a lot of times testing stuff. Um, and unfortunately it's testing it in production, which is probably the probably the worst. But um, for a lot of these patches, what'll happen is some of the stuff, again, because there's so few lines changing, um, there's so much straightforward, meaning, um, what what I get concerned is when I'm when I'm seeing many different line changes, and there's possible many different ramifications for it. Some of these changes, like that Xiphon has done, or something like that, or even Celsta. I mean, the, the the lines, the amount of things that have changed is is somewhat minimal. So it's like okay, I can kind of wrap my head around this. There's only so many things that could happen as a result of this. Um, but yeah, that, that's definitely high up on the concern that we actually shoot ourselves in the foot, uh, open up another hole, or just do something uh, something else terribly dumb. So like that's where typically we're testing it um, pretty quickly because I because again a lot of this stuff has to do with the 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 P two P communication channel. So the testing is primarily like okay, does it at least still work? And okay, let's probe it in all these different scenarios and make sure that there's uh, at least that it's not worse. And, um, and there's also a couple other people that have shown up. I don't know who in the world these people are sometimes. It's really weird. But someone has shown up and they're sort of anonymously giving us security reviews now. So they'll, they'll look at the patch that goes up on GitHub and they'll say, that one looks pretty good or that one looks pretty bad. And, and, and actually, the feedback is actually kind of good. Hmm. So, um, I mean, a lot of times it's frustrating because, like, I'll say, I'll, t I'll say everybody. I, I think part of the problems I, I have a very difficult time expressing myself. So I'll say, yeah, I said that an hour ago, and they're like, oh, I didn't understand what you were saying. I'm like, well, okay, but um, whoever this, whoever that person is, and I guess I won't even give their their IRC handle away, but they've been helpful as well. Well, I, I guess that that's open source at its best, right? So you're you're getting the these other eyes that are looking at it. Um, is there a concern that, you know, you have, you know, the, the nefarious actors trying to infiltrate in that way as well? And Oh, that's, I mean, oh, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be the most obvious thing to do, right? So how, how is that dealt with? I mean, or how do you know uh, that? Obviously you don't, but if somebody has been compromised in some way or what, what are the, any well, thoughts there? I'd love to hear what you I guys feel like talk about. If you can, I don't, I don't want you to reveal too much, but. The, well, again, see, the thing is, I, I'm sort of, I feel like I'm sort of in the outs of there as well, because I'm sure Fluffy Pony and his crew, the the, the actual core team, because there's um, technically Manu and I are not in the core team. I'm sure they've got their own, I don't want to say secret handshake, but I'm sure they've got their own process that they, uh, because this is actually, Ricardo has mentioned this before, um, aka Fluffy Pony. Uh, one of the things that he has mentioned was that most of them that were around from the beginning, um, they sort of have a high level of trust because they were there when Monero was worth pennies or not even worth pennies. And so there was this sort of like, well, how do we let new people in? Um, and I don't know, for instance, Binary Fate was one of the people that were brought into the core community as a core team member. I, I don't know the process for that. I can say that there's a handful of developers. We each 
look at a new person extremely skeptically <laughs> um, to the point where it's almost like paranoid, neurotic, like some psychologist would be like, there's something wrong with you guys because I can only imagine <laughs> between and I hope he doesn't mind sharing this. I don't think he will, but between Howard, Moo, myself and, and a few others, like it, we're all it's like, I don't know about this new person. <laughs> uh, but no, normally I'd say it, it's when um, the only thing that gets really, really odd is when someone gets really aggressive with wanting their ideas put forward. That's when we're like, why is this person like so eager to get this in? Um, cause it, because again, if someone can make an argument against it, I mean, sometimes you can just touch just people's personalities. And I think that a lot of times I have to let go and go, I don't know, people can, you know, people are very strange, right? But yeah, sometimes when someone comes in and they're like super brood and like fire ice was the classic case of this, right? I mean, it was so over the top where we're like, who the hell is this guy? Like, what is he trying to do here? Right. And so, um, there, I, at least for me, I don't know of any, no, I, I'm, I, I'll be completely honest. I don't know of any formal process. There may be an info, there may be a formal process that I am unaware of. Um, the only, the process, but the process in my head is going, um, if they're a new contributor, particularly if, like, I'll, I'll be willing to trust someone that has a screen name, even if I don't know their identity, but they have a screen name and they've been around for a while and they've just been plugging away and giving and saying, mostly saying things. Oh, and, and the other thing too is it goes both ways. If, if they're, when you see someone that's not willing, like if you're trying to explain yourself and they just sort of ignore it and talk over, like you see this on Reddit quite a bit where Arctic Mine or whoever will try to explain themselves and then someone else comes in and just talks over them and ignores everything they've said. You don't really know whether they're, they're malicious, but you know that they're not really work, probably worth working with. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of like it, it, you have to get, gain a sort of a, a sense of you can't just start making all these wild claims because then everyone thinks you're a crazy person. Instead, you just have to sort of like keep people at a distance until they're at least willing to listen to what the existing people in the project say. Um, yeah, if that makes it. I think that, I think I answered it. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Is there a concern that somebody like cypher trace or maybe even with deeper resources and pockets <laughs> would, would try to, uh, uh infiltrate in that way and then even maybe turn people you know turn turn them over to their side that's been i've been very suspicious of that actually um i just because well when you're in the cryptocurrency community long enough i feel like a year in cryptocurrency is like 10 years of real life like you see because people are crazy when it comes to making money you see like every thing a possible in a personality trade and in like a condensed time period including every absurd way of like making money or you know what i mean just lying to people or whatever so yes to me like i've thought about that like what would what would they do if they try to infiltrate for the negative and i'm sure and i know for a fact that multiple the developers have thought about you know whether they have a pro i don't think they have a process necessarily but they've each sort of internalize that exact scenario um and that's sort of i guess probably like the people discuss this with bitcoin a lot um i know there was a writer at coindesk that munch mentioned that um if monero grew they would have the same issues bitcoin did right because you'd have these people coming in and again uh, you know what is their what is their intent you don't really know so yeah, I mean it is a concern, but it's it's just it's part of the indescribable world of when people are like, "What's your job like?" and I'm just like, it doesn't even make sense. Like it's <laughs> it's it's also you know indicative of the fact that that we are growing. It's part of the growing pains, and you know, we're we're at that that point uh, where Monero is really having its its battle here. Yeah, I mean, like you said earlier, it could just be this, this is a sign of that Monero's made it, right? Now that we're attracting all the, the lunatics, that means we've... <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. What if you, if you know, for anybody who is listening and that is on, on, on the good side of Monero that wants Monero to succeed, and I, I certainly think it, it will, um, what can those people do? What could... What can people do at different levels, different levels of skill? Obviously, you know, uh, a developer contributing, but are there other things that regular people in the community can do to help improve Monero and make it more robust? 
Yeah, um, I know this came up also recently, and I think Monero, there's a, um, one interesting room to be in would be IRC channel, Man hashtag Monero dash community, or just the Monero chat room. But the community one is interesting because there's sort of people sort of looking to contribute the way that, that you're mentioning. There's another person here locally to me that wants to run Monero, just asked me out of the blue, because they knew I worked with Monero, wanted to run a Monero node. And he was sort of saying like, I, these instructions online, I don't know. So, for instance, I'm probably going to, I don't want to say use him, but I mean, sort of gain what he's telling me about like what's confusing about the instructions. So there's that kind of angle. If you can say the instructions online aren't very helpful, that is actually helpful to us because then we can write mm -hmm. more clear ones because the difficult part is once you have at a certain point, it's hard for me to know what is a clear instruction. I mean, it sounds counterintuitive because you're like, well, why can't you just write a clear instruction? It's like, well, because I don't know what, I don't even know, I don't even really know the the average person's vantage point at this point. Right, and you're you're on such a such a, a, a like a high yeah, level it, of understanding. It's hard for you to get back into the eyes of somebody oh, well, who's not there. Right, and I, I, but and when they point it out to me, I can immediately re-explain it on the spot and then rewrite it. But sometimes when I'm right, if I'm writing just a word document, you know, it's just sort of the classic case. And also, I think it also has to do with, I guess, how good you are at writing. But so there's probably a lot of it. If you go to that those IRC communities, they, I think there'll be some good outlet on steering people in the right direction. Um, Justin, AK Samsung Galaxy player, is also, I think, working probably, I don't say the hardest, but he's, he's working pretty diligently on this. Um, and he started, he's starting the Monero space community. So I think what they're trying to do is create a, they were discussing starting a, a web form separate from Reddit. And I think one of the goals of this was more of a, angle to like how people can help expand Monero like as opposed to because like the Monero subreddit at this point is sort of more just discussing general things about Monero this may be discussing things about organizing various different stuff or whatever mm -hmm. so um, I think at this point we've probably got enough translators it seems like because translators were one of the things we needed for a while we've probably it's we got plenty of those um, maybe some more people on the GUI I don't know you'd have to ask Syph on that um that one seems to be pretty short up. The The difficult part right now is the wallet side is really needs improvement. And it's really difficult because implementing Monero wallet is more complicated than this is the one downside of Monero. Because of the cryptography involved, implementing a Monero wallet is more complex than implementing a Bitcoin wallet. At least in my opinion. Um, even though there's a scripting language in Bitcoin, there's a lot more cryptographic operations that act like a scripting language. And then when you get these people saying, and we're going to do Bitcoin atomic swaps, my first thought is, oh, great. Now, <laughs> the wallet manufacturers have a hard enough time implementing Monero, basic Monero, how they get to implement multi-sig with atomic swaps and all this other stuff. I'm like, yes, this seems... So anyway, my, my point is, um, if they're not a programmer, I would say the biggest help would be sort of helpful for tutorials um, and coming in the community um, to sort of share what they didn't understand and what helped because it, it does help get in it does help us to sort of retarget if we don't understand like because some people it takes a while to understand ring signatures for instance or whatever all right so um, also the zero to Monero book may help people I guess for those that are watching I don't know if you've heard mm -hmm. of that book mm -hmm. um, and also that book is actually open source and you can contribute via GitHub, if I recall. So that's another interesting angle to it as well that you can um, sort of write different books on different topics. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, if you're not a programmer, it's a little hard at this stage um, other than running a node um, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I wish I could say that there was more, but... All right. No, no, those, those, are, those are great answers. I would say, you know, running, running a full, full node. Uh, and like I said, I think we'll do another show on that. Try to um, do kind of a tutorial on how to get one up and running in the easiest way. Oh, possible. And, and I also have, there's two different projects to re-implement my Monero locally for your privacy. So another interesting angle to this as well is if you learn how to run your own node, you can then learn how to run open Monero or... Monero Lite wallet server. Um, that's the one that I wrote separately. The difference is one uses, well, you can look online to see what the differences are. 
Um, but the advantage of that is if you run one of these servers for your, for your friend, they can then use the iPhone app and it connects to your, so that's where we want to get. We want to get to a scenario where there's semi knowledgeable people that can run a Monero daemon, run one of these light wallet server type daemon, either open Monero or the one that I wrote. And then the iPhone app connects to their buddy's server um, at home. So then, I mean, that sort of, I guess, hurts the my Monero people a little bit, um, but they've, they're mostly supportive on that because they're, they're still going to get tons and tons of people coming in. But the advantage there is um, you're leaking your privacy to your buddy as opposed to this far off other organization. Um, so learning how to run a Monero node is step one. Step two might be learning how to run one of these demons. And so what we want to get to is, um, unfortunately, opening up one of these demons, you have to learn how to open up your ports. <laughs> uh, I'm running one of these servers, so there's that, there's that. Angle. So there's a little bit of learning to do, but it's it's more um, IT related than I guess programming related. And I think many people can can learn it. Um, we also want to get to a point possibly where it's really almost point and click again. Like you buy that box, it gets it up and running, and then it creates a Tor hidden service address. And so now it's a matter of that person on their iPhone making connection to a Tor hidden service address, um, which is kind of unique and, and, a, little, and a, a little interesting. Um, but we're, we're a ways off on that still. Uh, but yeah, so that, that'll help out a lot of people because if your friends want to say, well, I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to run my own node and I want privacy. What do I do? You can say, here's an address. It's my address or it's my URL and they're brought and everything's being, and they can't spend, they can, but they can see money coming in and out. Which is, which is unfortunate, but they can't spend. And it's instant. So the it's like my Monero, that server is scanning in the background. So their phone sees an instant come in instantly. Unless your friend's name is Fire Ice. Do, do, not, listen, <laughs> do not listen. Do not trust that guy. That's true. You, you have to take into account how long you've known this person. If a person, <laughs> if a person shows up at your door and offers to run you a Monero node for you, he's probably, he's probably a Fed you know, or something. I don't know. You don't... <laughs> All right. Well, this is great. This has been a uh, you know uh, a great show to kick off the new year here for Monero. I do feel like uh, there's a lot of uh, fear right now in the Monero community, um, just on yeah, a the, superficial level with with the you know Monero, yeah Monero was delisted from the yeah. exchange, so there's all that fud going around, and then people watching the network network being attacked and not really fully understanding it. Uh, but me being the eternal Monero uh optimist uh, i'm feeling pretty good seeing you guys working hard reacting to it uh seeing the, the silver lining which is you know uh building a remote more robust network and going through these growing pains so and and the fact that you know it's kind of uh i wouldn't say a good problem to have but it's indicative of the fact that monero is doing something right if all these resources and efforts are being put towards essentially trying to uh thwart it Yes, yeah, someone made in one circumstance a fairly custom demon to pull off the attack. So this wasn't someone that spent four hours on a weekend doing it. I mean, they this this could have been one person that pulled it off, but they were spending a decent amount of time to make these custom changes for that first attack. The second attack um, still required custom work because you had a you, the the official the official code wouldn't send out you couldn't use the official code to send out data this way. You had to come up with your own custom stuff. It took probably a little bit less time. It took more time researching to figure out how to do it and less time writing code. But again, though, I think what your point is that this wasn't something, this wasn't just someone sitting around two hours on a weekend that just decided to do this. How I about mean, an actual resources? What were the resources involved as well? What, what, what was required? So the uh, first one was pretty serious because they had, it looks like they had multiple many IP addresses, possibly in, in a couple of different data centers. So this wasn't just, like I said, this wasn't just some person with one-off resources. They had, they had to spend a little bit of money to do it because they were, they were trying to make it appear that many different connections from many different locations. Because we... What's right like, now, an, like an idea of, of money spent? Like I know, like just ball. Oh, like we're talking I, don't, I don't really know because like, it looked like to me anyway, and this is just very anecdotal and I didn't investigate too heavy, but it looked like at least like five different... or probably at least three different data centers or something like that. And maybe because I, I was seeing stuff come out of five different 
IP address ranges that were completely off because we actually filter by IPA range, hopefully to spread who we're connecting to. So one way to, to get around that is, well, you just get IP addresses in multiple different regions throughout the world. So, I mean, you're spending like $5 a month times uh, is probably, you know, actually, I think someone had ran through this. Um, Sniper did, who's the new head lead maintainer. I think it was probably over 100 machines or so. I think he wanted to say possibly. So something like five or five to $10 times 100 per month. Uh, I mean, that's like a bare minimum threshold. Right, right. But plus, you have to consider the, the, the human time, the human labor time. Right. Um, the, this was like, this wasn't, time. right, this wasn't one person, four hours. I mean, this, they probably, they, they wrote a fairly custom, either from, the, from scratch or a very customized demon to do this. And the second one, they also had to do a lot of research as well. So, I mean... I don't know. I mean, probably at least 40 plus hours a week. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I, I, I really don't know. Cause I haven't really thought about it. I haven't really like gone. You're just, you're just giving me the thought in my head, but I wouldn't be surprised if it took me at least two weeks of work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which again, isn't, it's not a huge amount, but also very few of us would say, I'm going to spend two work weeks attacking some cryptocurrency. Right. So, um, and possibly more than that. And in fact, I guess I should clarify that's two weeks of, that's like one to two weeks of work if they have my existing level of knowledge of Monero, mm -hmm. which is why I think most people assume fire rice, because since he's so familiar with it from working with it, the amount of time to make changes is less. Whereas if someone, if someone, if they paid someone in cold, so to speak, I mean, it would probably take them a month at least because mm -hmm. they would have to spend some time to get familiar with how the code worked first and then, and then figure out what they wanted to do. So that would, the, the, the lead time would be a little bit longer. So again, though, like, like I said, whoever did this, I mean, this wasn't a, a this was a non-trivial amount of resources. Um, yeah. Oh, and I'll, the other thing I wanted to point out to you is you're the ever optimist. I, I'm always a bit amused by the ever pessimist in the community that seem to stick around and say, and, and the sky is always falling, but I'm like, well, why do you keep <laughs> Need money is always asking the same question. There's, the there's a lot of neurotic people, I think. In, yeah, uh, yeah. The narrow space in particular. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. This is an, I think this is an amazing discussion, um, and we'll hopefully get this up soon. Uh, just for those listening, where where can people follow you and learn more? Uh, so my Twitter handle is at vt nerd. That's Victor Tango Nerd. Um, I also, my, my URL is leeclaggett.com. So that's L E E C L A G E T T.com. Or I think it's actually, I own vtnerd.com too. I think it redirects to that. Um, so that's from there. I think I have all of my social media posts linked on there. So you can get to my GitHub and, uh, anything else I, I post very infrequently on, on online, but I should probably do more, especially given the attacks where a lot of people are trying to figure out. Uh, what's going on kind of thing right and and um the other because the other angle you see people is anybody working on this uh meanwhile like you know a bunch of us are running around with the hair on fire and it's you know <laughs> um anyway yep that's it if somebody wanted to contact you with a particular question what is the easiest way to do that um so you can find my email address on my on my website it's probably the one that i'll see the quickest you can send it i get so few twitter I sh I'm gonna probably regret this, but I have. Well, I guess. Well, we'll see. My Twitter DMs are open. I, I get very. I haven't made much effort to, to get much followers on there, so I don't have a whole lot of just spam yet. Um, but email would probably be good if you okay. if you see that. That's either either way, depending on the length, really. And then, um, oh, Reddit. You could. Some people message me over Reddit sometimes. Um, the, the direct message system over Reddit or whatever. Or IRC. I'm on IRC all the time. Same username. All right. Lee, thank you, man. Greatly yep. appreciate it. Thanks yep. for all your work. Yeah, man. Good luck. Good luck uh, with your uh, Monero demon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well, we'll see what comes with that. I think that will be a good next show. We'll see if I can get that get that up and running. Uh, that would be I'm surprised no one has done that yet. I don't think Justin has even done that yet. So yeah, I don't think there's a... Yeah, I don't think... There is a good, I can't, we kind of tr attempted it like a year ago, but we didn't really get into the nuts mm. and bolts of actually getting it up and running. There may have been something like that at, at DEF CON, but that was so specific to the people at DEF CON that it doesn't, it's not really helpful now. Yep. Um, yeah. So. All right, man. Yep. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. 
We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.